Good evening and welcome to this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. I am Nelly Skipid. On this evening's program, we bring your report from the Prime Minister's press conference held on Tuesday, May 9th. We bring you an interview on the Environmental Health Expanded Styrofoam Regulation and we have a report on the National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission's consultations on Internet governance and its impact. We have the details to these stories coming up. Let's join Ashisha Sam for Newswatch. Stay with us. Good evening and welcome to News Watch for Tuesday, May 11th, 2017. I'm Ashisi Assam. Thank you very much for joining us. At a press conference on Tuesday, Prime Minister the Honourable Dr. Alf Gonzales updated the media on the progress of the government's mission on the implementation of a school bus system here. The Prime Minister indicated that the buses will be leased to private owners. Very shortly, we are going to have 810 school buses. We are, paid, we are sent off the deposit already. They are operating through a local company which is sourcing the buses. There are going to be buses in the region of 25 seaters, 22, 25 seaters. I don't have the specification for every of them, every one of them. The Minister of Transport has the specifications. Of course, I had to source the money. I have to do all of that. And we said, I'm involved in helping to direct the policy. And what we are going to do here. We are going to advertise for buses, for people to operate these buses. The government itself is not going to run the buses. The Prime Minister also added that the government's goal is to ultimately empower persons to become entrepreneurs through this new system. Now, if I put a bus on the road for you for $120,000 and you sensible and you run it. Within four years time, I expect you, from you running that, would be able to buy another bus. I want to build the entrepreneurs also. That was Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Alf Gonzales updating the media on the progress of the government's mission on the implementation of a school bus system here. In exercise of the powers conferred by the Price and Distribution of Good Act, CAP 161, approval is granted for changes to be made to the prices of liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, with effect from Wednesday, May 10, 2017. Maximum retail prices for LPG cylinders as of May 10, 2017. LPG 100 pound, areas 1, 2, and 3, $178.10. Area 4, $199.10. LPG 95 pound, Petro Carib, areas 1, 2, and 3, $145. Area 4, $166. LPG 25 pound area 1 $44.50 area 2 $45.50 area 3 $46.50 area 4 $49.50 LPG 22 pound Petro Carib area 1 $33.50 area 2 $34.50 Area 3, $35.50. Area 4, $48.50. LPG, 20 pound, $36.60. Area 1, Area 2, $37.60. Area 3, $38.60. And Area 4, $41.60. Retail prices reflect the average spot prices in the months of December 2016, January 2017, and February 2017. As such, subsequent price changes will reflect average spot prices in the months after February 2017. 
Area 1, Kingstown to Camden Park and Kingstown to Annisville. Area 2, beyond to Camden Park to Curtinus and Villa to Langley Park. Area 3, beyond Langley Park to Fancy. Beyond Curtinus to Richmond. Area 4, the Grenadines. Under the Price and Distribution of Goods Act, Cap 161, no person shall sell, buy, or agree to sell or buy any goods at a price greater than the maximum fixed price of that good. Any person who contravenes the provision is guilty of an offense and are liable to a fine of not less than $1,500, but more than $3,000, but not more than $15,000. Also under this act, sellers are obligated to provide to customers, once requested, a receipt of delivery slip showing the date of sale, quantity and type of LPG cylinder sold, and the price charged. Any person who contravenes of or fails to comply with this provision is guilty of an offense. Intra-regional and international trade potential has been strengthened following a recent OECS trade mission held in St. Lucia, Martinique and Dominica from April 24th to 28th, 2017. Minister of Agriculture for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable Sabota Caesar, led the delegation and was accompanied by Mr. Jai Rampasad in charge of purchasing, as well as Mr. Norman Pemberton in charge of logistics. Several key areas of regional and international trade were discussed, such as international market opportunities, certification, transportation, marketing research and development, production technology, agro-processing, monitoring and control, and ICT platforms. The OECS trade delegation met with key stakeholders in St. Lucia, Martinique, and Dominica to discuss existing market conditions and each island's particular strengths and weaknesses as it relates to the production and preparation for export of agricultural produce. That's where we end News Watch for this evening. The API's presentation continues. Do stay with us. I'm Ashisi Sam. Good evening. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Welcome back. Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, held a press conference on May 9th, 2017, where he discussed a number of current affairs for this country. Included in these were LIAT, the Ameriget 767 capacity expansion in services delivery, increasing developments in Kanawan, among other issues. Sheridan Lewis tells us more. Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez held a press conference on Tuesday, May 9, 2017 to report on his trip abroad and other state matters. Passenger and cargo airlifts took prominence as Dr. Gonzalez indicated that Amerijet 767 landed at the Argyle International Airport on Tuesday, May 9 and will begin regular scheduled service to St. Vincent from next month. The Prime Minister also pointed out the impact of this new move since this increases the cargo capacity. I've been informed by the agent and also by the people at AIA the agent for Marijet, that they're going to come here. They've done this flight, but the 767s are going to come regularly for Marijet from June. Why is this important? The 767 carries, has a capacity of 110 thousand pounds of cargo as against 55,000 with the 727s. 
But when the 727s were landing in E.T. Joshua, because of the wind factor and the configuration of that airport, that 727 was able only to take three, maximum four pallets. But from the time they started to go to Argyle, there were 11 and 12 pallets, which would, would be their, their capacity. So already, you remember that earlier on there was talk, all kind of talk about how Ralph wanted to take away agent from a marriage jet from this person to this. I mean, I, I don't run a marriage jet. How do I want to take away agency? And I would always maintain that whoever operating a marriage jet in St. Vincent as an agent would make more money now. Because even the existing 727s would, would, would be able to land at Argyle with full capacity. And now we're talking about the 767, which is twice the capacity of the 727s. And the 767, you need the highly specialized and expensive equipment, the millions of dollars equipment, which the AIA has, which we bought, this government bought, as part of the equipment of the, by IADC for this airport. Very top of the line equipment. I've been advised, everybody who, 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 who deals with the, the Amerijet people themselves told me it's top of the line equipment we have. And when, when, we, when we hired the gentleman from Jamaica who had been working at the Donald Sangster International Airport in Montego Bay, which is a busier airport in Jamaica than Norman Manley. And he came and he said, listen, the equipment we have is good top quality, but we need some redundancies. We need some additional pieces, just in case any of these were to, to, to break down. You don't want to have a big aircraft on the ground and, and you have to wait. And I, I gave the go ahead, though, though, though it involved additional expenditure. I gave the go ahead because I want when we finish this thing. You see you young people, I don't want when I finish with all of this thing, you know, that you say, well, Ralph, build this thing in a halfway house for you. That's a marriage yet. I want, I want, first of all, all the consumers who are listening to me. You see this thing which you have called the cell phone? And People have credit cards. You know how easy people buy things online these days? It becomes easier when you have better cargo lift to bring the stuff. It means that the persons on the ground who are selling, they have to up their game too. Because they're competing not only with who is next to them in Middle Street or Back Street, but who is on the other end of the phone? I know what they're, what they're saying to me. Well, Ralph, you're going to lose taxes. No, I ain't going to lose taxes. Because customs have to deal with it when it comes in too. So, and if you have greater volumes, you would expect reasonably that the unit costs will fall. Then I want the farmers to hear me. When the plane leaves here, when the 767 leaves here, it goes to St. Lucia, not to overnight, like how the 727s would overnight down in Trinidad. They leave St. Vincent, they go to St. Lucia. By one o'clock, they reach Miami. You see what can happen to your fresh fruit and vegetables? And if you have the volumes, they will go straight from here to Miami. And this is one of the things which the investors are looking at. The investors who are talking to Saboto and Camilo, but Stuart Otherson, the one who is dealing with the, 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 the seafood packaging plan, mainly lobster and conch, but, but outside of the season for lobster and conch fish.
The Prime Minister used the opportunity to outline progress made by the government, with Air Canada scheduled operations here for the ending of this year, and also revealed other arrangements on stream. You heard Air Canada made their report publicly, they announced that they're coming out of Toronto. Coming out for the season from December the 14th to April 25th, I think, or 28th. But there's another entity which is coming out from Canada, and I'm waiting until they make the announcement too. There's going to be a short overlap over the Christmas New Year, but there's going to be movement before and after um, Air Canada. But I'm not, you know, I always say, let the airlines do the announcements. Remember I've said that? Let them do the announcements. No. I want to say to you that we will be having flights coming direct out of Miami. It, the announcements would be made by those who are responsible. And as well, already that you know, we have Cal on Fridays and, and Sundays making the particular connection first with the ATR, but just a turnaround for an hour in Trinidad with the jets going up to, to New York. And I happen to know other conversations are being held with Cal for other things. And I told you about the conversation Glenn has been having, he and his team, out of UK. And I want to say more broadly that there are other conversations with other airlines. And there are conversations with local pilots who are interested in doing expanding the aviation business and this government will support them in a sensible business plan in going forward. The Prime Minister made an address at the Caribbean Hotel Resort and Investment Summit, CRIS, which was held in Miami and is an annual gathering of hotel and resort entities operating in the Caribbean. Other officials, mainly within the tourism industry here, were present. And I made the pitch for investment in the hotels and naturally coming upon the, the, the airport, the opening of the Argyle International Airport. The Tourism Authority and Invest SVG and National Properties, who all attended, who had representation there, they prepared a, 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 a video, and while I was speaking, the video was, was, um, was being displayed on the, the monitor, and um, I, was, I was able to explain the opportunities which are available for investment in this, in, in, in these areas, both hotel and resort con, um, the construction. There was a good team on the ground for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. From Invest SVG, there was Glen Beach, from, and there, there was also from, from, um, uh, in Vest SVG, there was Alan Alexander from National Properties, because the property, national property is very important to the whole discussion since they have an, uh, a, we have a lot of state lands in national properties for investment purposes. There was um, Damien Brown, there was Hans King, and, and um, Dr. Matthias was there in respect of talking also about the airport. Meetings were arranged for me with an investment entity, which we are in touch with, and with three name brands. Two of them, Camillo, I had been in touch with them and had assisted in arranging those meetings. <coughs> and two of those name brands, hotels, 
representatives are coming between the 15th of May and the end of June. They have to inform us of the specific time. But the discussions are promising. Prime Minister Gonzales announced the Miller Group of Hotels visit to St. Vincent, which was scheduled for Wednesday, May 10, 2017, with the prospects of investments in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Also, according to the Prime Minister, the Virgin Atlantic Group visited the Bukuma Resort with plans of having it operationalized. The Finance Minister said he is keen to see the resort up and running for this coming tourist season. Meanwhile, on more news of investment, Prime Minister Gonzales highlighted that further developments will take place on the island of Kanawan. This adds to the recent developments of the Glassy Bay Marina. The developers in Kanawan, Mr. Pinataro, has indicated to me that he is interested, their group, they're interested in building a a hotel to take care of the pilot and crew principally for the airlines, the, 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 the planes which are coming to Canawan. In fact, the number of private jets which are coming to Canawan now, they don't have enough space for their parking and they would want Argyle to be the, the hub and that's why they have worked out with the AIA, the Argyle International Airport, an area where they're going to put down a hangar and also put a fixed base operation to service these, these, these jets. Um, and I know that they, they're actively looking for land to see where they can build this, this hotel. They're not in. They're not. They're not in the business of building a hotel, really, for general use, but specifically for people who 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 gonna come for the pilots and crew for these jets. Of course, other people would be able to stay there, depending on the size that they eventually decide to build it. Um, I also know that. Camillo has been having active discussions because the cabinet has put him in charge of a committee and he has been working with entities within the state for and to be involved with the state for for the 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 construction of a hotel to be managed of course by not by the government but by a, a, a reputable private sector uh, entity, and we 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 have been given approvals to several Vincentians who are expanding their hotels and who are building apartments and the like. And I'm 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 happy to see we are picking up in 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 that regard. The I had the opportunity, as I said, to talk to Boot Stewart to further the discussion which Camillo and Bud Stewart's son, one of his sons, um, which they've been having about sandals for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But all these things are, they don't just happen like that. You have to work on an ongoing basis with them. Making reference to his address at the opening of the Gecko branch at South Rivers, Dr. Gonzales emphasized the importance of boosting tourism on the community level. The government, as I indicated yesterday in, in, a, in a short speech I made in South Rivers, at the opening of the Gecko branch in South Rivers, a beautiful building, they built and equipped at a cost of 100 and sorry, $1.4 million, not $1.4 million, um, 10 times what I said there just now, $1.4 million, Eastern Caribbean. But I made the point there that what we have to do also is in the rural areas, make sure that people in the communities also benefit 
from tourism. The timber cottages which can be put down. From North Leeward all the way back up to North Windward and in between. And, and the government is prepared to assist persons, entrepreneurs in doing this in the same way that we are interested and have been assisting people with people who are involved in, 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 in information technology. Uh, a lot of them mainly young people. In, in, um, we, we, we have borrowed a significant amount of money from the, the World Bank, but we are giving them as grants. And different people have received grants. I, 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 I think I was told a number around 20 varying sizes. Of course, you don't get all the money one time. It's done in, 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 in stages. On the 5th of May 2017, Prime Minister Gonzales participated in the Leadership and Innovation Conference, which was held in Trinidad and sponsored by the University of the West Indies Institute of Business. A number of education officials here were also in attendance. Dr. Gonzales highlighted creativity in schools within the 21st century as one of the topics being addressed. Because one of the, the issues which was being discussed in the Caribbean, what would a creative school of the, the 21st century increasingly look like? Because this is an important area for further development. I just want to say this, I don't know if the media, if you, are, if you are aware of it, I know a release came out from the office of the permanent representative, or permanent representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Rhonda King, concerning St. Vincent and the Grenadines' role, leadership role, in relation to creativity and innovation at the United Nations. If you haven't seen that, really there has to be some neglect out of the Ministry of foreign affairs or the lack of proper connection with all the various media houses are coming out. You've seen it? Huh? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I, I don't know. Have you all seen it? Oh, no. Well, that's, that's, you need to see it. What happened is this. Very important because Ambassador Rhonda King has been working on this matter for a while. And we piloted, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we piloted a resolution at the General Assembly, the United Nations General Assembly, on the 28th of April, which is just two weeks um, gone. Not quite two weeks yet. And the, the, the resolution was on creativity and innovation. And for a day to be declared Creativity and Innovation Day. And April 21st, 2018 will be the first United Nations declared Creativity and Innovation Day. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines is, been, has been given the responsibility to work with the United Nations bureaucracy in having a summit, a high-level summit, on creativity and innovation on the 20th of April next year. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we sponsored the resolution, and we got 87 or 88 countries um, which co-sponsored the resolution. We were the lead, we sponsored it, and then we got co-sponsored by, by um, many very important countries all over the world. Canada, for instance, India, South Africa, Turkey, a, a host of countries. Um, I think Brazil was there, Mexico. And it was adopted by acclamation at the General Assembly. Ambassador King made a very important statement.
Prime Minister Gonzales also noted further infrastructural developments, specifically on roads and a number of schools here that will get on the way soon. We'll bring you more on these stories on a subsequent program. Reporting for the API, I am Sheridan Lois. When the API program continues, we learn more on measures taken to implement a ban on styrofoam products. Stay with us. Protecting our marine environment. Our forests, our wildlife for our children. Pollution of our rivers and beaches. Deforestation and overfishing threaten to destroy our biodiversity. Protected areas are set aside by law to protect these fragile ecosystems which provide us with water, food, electricity and recreation. Tobago Keys Marine Park, Kingsville Forest Reserve and Milligan Key Wildlife Reserve are examples of our local protected areas. Be inspired and help preserve what is naturally ours. Let's value nature. Protected areas protect life. A message from the Environmental Management Department and the National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority. Thanks for staying with us. Styrofoam is a product made from polystyrene, a petroleum-based plastic. It is processed using chemicals that are steamed and expand, creating the substance EPS, expanded polystyrene. This product, though used widely, has been proven to have harmful effects on human health and the environment. And so the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has, as of May 1st, imposed a ban on styrofoam products through the passing of the bill, the Environmental Health Expanded Polystyrene Ban Regulations No. 21 of 2017. Tonight, Okolo John Patrick of the Ministry of Trade and Leslie Millington of the Customs and Excise Department speaks to Kathy Rose about the ban and its impact. Good evening. I have with me here Ms. Okolo John, Mrs. Okolo John Patrick, Trade Officer to the Ministry of Trade, Mr. Leslie Millington, a Supervisor at Customs. They're going to be talking about the Environmental Health Expanded Polystyrene Regulation, something that is quite hot these days in terms of the topic. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to API. Why Thank are you not ready? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having us. First of all, just give an explanation, just like if the average person can understand what this is, because everybody have their own interpretation of it. As of May 1st, 2017, the government has imposed the ban on styrofoam, the importation of styrofoam in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The reason for the ban is sort of twofold, one for the environmental impact and also for health reasons. Research has shown that um, there are cancer-related health issues as it relates to the use of styrofoam. Hence, the government has seen it fit to ban the importation. Now, we would have had concerns as it relates to the number of styrofoam already in St. Vincent and Grenadines. And so while the ban is on the importation as of May 1st, there have been um, extension in terms of the consumption. So you will find that the ban is in May 1st, but persons can use the containers up until the 31st of January 2017, 2018. And the ban is basically on containers as it relates to food, serving of food, the cups, the plates, and also the trays that normally um, have the grapes and your fruits and your vegetables within the supermarket. Now, um, many countries in the region, they would have also imposed the ban. We have Guyana being one of the first and the more advanced in terms of the ban. They would have placed a ban on the um, importation of ster um, styrofoam. And also Dominica. Dominica, they are also now looking at it. I think they are taking a different slant as it relates to tarification, meaning that they will increase the tariff at the border. So member states, I think, um, in it, I think going um, looking forward there may be a regional approach because each member state is now looking into it because of its effect on the health and on our environment now for those wholesalers like the locals will probably buy from those here who have them or well have them in stock or had ordered already and apparently 
between the ban and no, they're on their way. What happens to them? Well, yeah, there's, there's provision in the, in the Act for that. Um, well, to begin with, if you, you, you allowed, if you're in the trade, you are allowed to import these, styrene, these products um, up to 90 days from the first of this month. No, you have. Let me just stop it. So that means I can still order between now and then up to 90 no. days? No, but no. just like if the order is already in if place. If the order has been placed prior to the first, and you can prove to the control of customs that your order was placed before the, the date of the start of the ban, then you are allowed to import your products. Now you have until 90 days from the first of May to import. There's a cutoff point after that, you will not be able to. Now the products that is already on the market, you have until okay. January 2018, to the end of January 2018, to consume what you already have on the market. So how are we gonna keep check on that to make sure like after January that this is really not going to be in circulation. Are we going to have people going around to check or something? How are you going to do that, monitor yeah. that? Well, yeah, um, we have consumer affairs officers assigned to different zones and different areas, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and they'll be doing their spot checks, also their environmental health officers. So um, there are a team of persons that will be assigned to ensure that you know, it's no longer being utilized by the general public, whether your business or individual. One of the concerns I've been hearing on the ground mm -hmm. from people who sell food, who buy food, is that it's going to make food prices more expensive because the alternative costs a lot more. Some people start looking and giving that. So how are you going to justify it, at least ease that concern? That's what most people are thinking. Yes. That's what I hear on well, what yeah, is that, that's a comment well, I get. Well, mm -hmm. We understand that. There have been alternatives. Um, you have members of the trade have already brought items to us to look at them to see what the impact will be duty wise, import duty. And the government has given the mm -hmm. um, a, wave. a waiver on the VAT. Mm -hmm. Once the, the items can be recyc are recyclable. So it should not impact on the cost of the food. Because the, if, if they are basing the increase of the cost of the food on the alternative container, we are saying that the government in this wisdom, they have seen that that might have increased the cost of food. So the, the, the VAT will be removed on the alternatives. So, so it will also be the same as what the same. they had before. It should, yes. Okay. Um, I understand you all have been trying, well, been doing some media campaign, going out, reaching out. What is the feedback you're getting? Because, I mean, well, we're journalists. People probably tell us different things. I don't know what they'll tell you all. But what's the feedback you're getting? Are people w understanding what you're trying to do and are they cooperating? Um, you know, with change, I think you'll always have, like, certain persons not willing to change from doing something they normally do. Or it doesn't come as easy for some person. Sometimes it's when they but, don't understand properly. Too. Well, that too. But I think with a cultural change and a mindset, I mean, because once something is new, it's a new law or new rule, you know, sometimes it's not as easy trying to change from what you're accustomed to doing. So, um... Basically, we would have heard um, comments like, um, as you would have said, now food prices will go up, the businesses are concerned, but all of that would have been taken into consider consideration, hence the removal of the fat. And I think, um, you know, given time, person will come around because if you look at the objective of this, you know, the person has been saying that they've been using it for years and why now? Well, research have shown that um, it's related to cancer, and that is even, you know, a reason why a person should become more, more curious and, and concerned. we do have a number of cancer precisely cases Precisely, in St. Vincent yeah. and the Grenadines. So um, I think, you know, it will, be, it will come around. It will be a culture change. We, we also see in certain countries where they take their own containers to the, to the, to the um, restaurant to get their, um, to their meal. You know, we, when we go here, we normally get everything. Person overseas will take their containers and they will um, 
have their, their means. So I think um, gradually people will get into it and if they really look at the objective, the reason why it is being done, I think it will be easier to you know, adhere to the rules. My understanding is that there is a committee working along with in terms of this, this regulation, this ban, and to make sure that it's implemented smoothly. You could tell me about the committee, who's all on it and why. Okay, yeah. Um, so we have um, the Ministry of Legal Affairs, of course. <laughs> um, the Ministry of Economic Planning and Sustainable Development. The Ministry of Health and the Environment. The Bureau of Standards. Customs and Excise Department, the Ministry of Transport and Works, and also we have the expertise from the um, from the CWSC, Central Water and Sewage Authority. As it relates to, um, yes, the drains and stuff, you know, oh, the and yes, yes, they they play a role in that also. Yes, because I think one play. of the main focus of this bill, if you really take it into consideration, minus all what people are saying, is the environmental concern. Yes. And you do see it. Yes, You walk definitely. to Kingstown, even after an activity, you see all of uh -huh. that. All the containers from the barbecues and the different uh, meals that they would have um, consumed. So, okay, if after January 18, people are found with this, is there a fine? Yes. There was a fine. There's a little fine, is there, you know, so is there a fine for this? <laughs> yes, there, there is a uh, up to five thousand mm -hmm. dollars for the offense if you are found selling, using these items. Yes, there's a fine. Five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Maximum of five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Maximum or twelve. If I can pay the fine. And, uh, well, yeah. Twelve it's months. Twelve, 12 months, months imprisonment. imprisonment, and it can be both. You can be charged, fined, and also be sentenced to. What well, this speaks to how serious this is. Precisely. Okay, so after, what are we going to do between now and then? Because, um, well, I think I'm still seeing them around. I guess people still have the grace period. I think a lot of people might try to use that as a scapegoat to get around mm -hmm. with what they're going to do. So are we going to be having some monitoring now or only after January? No, um, I think um, since the ban has been, um, been in place, persons, the lit the, there's a litter act and there was an environmental act also so i think um person will still continue to to go around and monitor and try to you know ensure that things are not just thrown all over the place but um they are kept in the recycled bin and all of that so it will be monitored it will be monitored but um after the 31st of january 2018 it becomes an offense for you to be using it right so we just want the public to know and keep the date in mind. So the committee has plans to continue its um, public awareness campaign? Yes, after that? yes, we um, would endeavor to do such. Okay, well thank yes. you very much. Um, I wish you all the best. I hope people will cooperate and they can understand that this is being done with the best interest of the nation at heart. Stay with us. Our program continues in just a moment. With just one click, the internet connects people, businesses, and nations. Being connected can open a world of information and opportunities. You can get services and products of your choice much faster. From electronic financial transactions to connecting with family and friends. From being up to date with the latest news and information to learning new skills and acquiring academic qualifications. All from the convenience of your home or wherever you roam. Get connected today. This message is brought to you as a public service announcement by Ectel, the NTRC, and this station. Welcome back. The Internet Cooperation for Assigning Names and the Numbers, in collaboration with the National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, recently held a consultation on Internet governance. The event was geared towards educating the public on how the internet is governed locally and globally and to show its impact and interrelationships across all sectors of the economy on its users and providers. We have more in this report. On Tuesday, May 9th, 
The National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, NTRC, in conjunction with the Caribbean Regional Communications Infrastructure Program, CARSIP, and the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, CTU, hosted a forum at the French's House designed to introduce local civil society participants to the ideals of the Internet Cooperation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, in support of their vision of a One World, One Internet agenda. ICANN is a non-profit organization that provides technical operations of vital DNS resources, which loosely defined is the coordination of specific numerical identifiers unique to computers that allow for cross-communication and other networking necessary for data sharing. Hanif Sutherland, ICT manager at the National Insurance Services, NIS, gave an enlightening account of the introduction of Internet services to St. Vincent and the Grenadines well over 20 years ago. Sutherland, who had developed his own rudimentary form of data sharing around this time, explained how he became an integral part of the mainstreaming of commercial Internet services by then telecommunications service provider, Cable and Wireless. When Cable and Wireless launched the internet service, they had some you know, problems in customer care. And um, because I was heavily steeped in, um, in, in you know, networks and dial-up and so on, they it recruited me to come and work um, for them. And I joined the company um, as data services officer um, to primarily um, assist persons over the phone in getting connected onto the internet and troubleshooting, um, you know, issues that they would have had at the time, um, and that you know spun off into you know looking at the infrastructure that they had and improving it and so on. Mind you, when I joined Cable and Wireless, they they had about um, five or six banks of modems, and they had um, something called an E1 which is a digital connection all the way back into Barbados. So authentication and, and, and session usage was actually being built from out of um, Barbados. I think that was around 1993, 92, 93, uh, around that time. So you could see that um, when the when we have the explosion of the internet, there was just a short window of time when you know, everything really took off. But having looked at um, the service as it was available, um, the, the company realized that they need to carry the speeds up. Um, 28.8 at that time was, was a luxury. Then they moved up to 33.3. 33.6, and then we had 56K. Then after 56K, we said, okay, we really can't go anything further than that. And for a while, they really thought that, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna settle with 56K because we can't get, you know, to do anything more than that it will require like ISDN and they would have to have specialized circuits in order to provide that. Lo and behold, the, the market dictated what was to happen because the other um, company that could have theoretically provided that service at the time, Carib Cable, was very interested in providing cable. They were providing cable TV service, but they were also very interested in providing internet service. But they had a challenge in that their network was a one-way, a one-way network. I think when Cable and Wireless found out that Carib Cable was going to do this they started to pump a lot more money into research and so on. And hence, the early experiments um, for ADSL began. When Cable and Wireless launched their, um, their ADSL service, um, they primarily had that service available only in two exchanges, the first one being in Kingstown and the second one being in Mustique for obvious reasons. Um, you know, they would have looked at the bottom line and, and ensure that they return on investment um, in this equipment because it wasn't cheap at the time. Um, they then created their own ISP um, in that they had all the billing and records and so on being done from out of St. Vincent rather than Barbados. Uh, so uh, just to give you a, a synopsis of how the internet service, you know, really 
transpired and how it, how it came to being. Sometimes when we look at and we take for granted what we have today, I mean, we complain bitterly when we can't get a 10 meg connection versus the door streaming. We're spoiled by the 25 megs and the 100 megs. Um, but if we had to go back to the day when 300 baud was the accepted standard, a lot of us will go crazy. Um, so I say that for us to get a context as to how important it is for us as civil society to one, chat the way forward, to have dialogue, to engage each other, to network, to set the policies. Because it's sad to say, uh, the, the way that our market has, has changed, um, we have come from a, 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 a deregulated market and we've gone back into a situation where we have a, you know, an incumbent, we have a, a monopoly um, situation again. And when we have that, then our service levels you know, take a downward turn. Because if our providers have nothing to guide them or any benchmarks um, or anyone looking over their shoulder, then they tend to give us you know, pretty shoddy service. Manager of the Internet Society, ISOC, Shernan Osipa, offered remarks on behalf of his organization, which is geared towards promoting global Internet access and education, as well as providing guidelines relating to Internet usage and public policy. It's not about just being at an event and to give a presentation. It's what we're going to achieve by attending a given event. So that is why I would like to congratulate, let's say, um, the organizers of this event, because I don't look at it as an event. I look at it as an, as an initiative, an initiative where we will be focusing on how to develop, let's say, the internet in a given country, and in this particular case, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As we may know, during the last years, a couple of years ago, we lost, let's say, all our bananas and sugar industries in East, Eastern Caribbean. So we need to look at new ways how we can continue to develop, let's say, the economy in a given country. And I think we can do this through the internet. We have seen what the internet has done globally. It's a very powerful tool. So we need to get ourselves educated with regard to the internet and to use it um, to, to conduct businesses. The same things that others are doing in other parts of the world. We do have people in the region, the Caribbean, that are very knowledgeable, but I think we need the, the, all the tools to, to um, indeed use the, the, the full power of the internet to, to do great things. Meanwhile, Nigel Casimir, telecommunications specialist at the CTU, outlined the role and functions of the union as well as its regional significance. The CTU was established since 1989 by the Caribbean community, actually the, min uh, the ministers were responsible for telecommunications at the time, to be the intergovernmental telecommunications policy instrument for the Caribbean. So, it was formed with the intention of getting the Caribbean together to harmonize policies around telecommunications. And it was also formed at a time, as was described by Mr. Sutherland earlier, when there was a lot of upheaval taking place in the global community in telecommunications and the, the, the birth of the internet at, at the time. Since 1989, however, one cannot tell the difference between telecommunications and information technology. I am old enough to have seen a telephone exchange go from a mechanical clatter to something that looks like a data center, right? And basically what that means is that we've had this convergence and we now talk about information and communications technologies, ICT. So, the CTU recognized the trend at the time and in the course of its ongoing work, defined a new strategic direction way back in 2003 to include or to be addressing ICT. Even the International Telecommunication Union is also addressing ICT matters 
um, today. In doing this, however, um, with this new strategic direction, it was also noted that, you know, we needed to have a bit more diversity in the information sources that were used to develop the policies related to ICT. So the, the CTU expanded its membership to include other than just governmental members. And we actually um, have 20 member governments of the Caribbean, uh, but we also have now, uh, I think, at least 10 non-governmental members of the CTU. Through, through which, and we also have other collaborators who are not necessarily members, but who we, we work with in order to enrich the, the store of information we use to create the, the, the policies in ICT that we develop. And we work in five main areas of, of, of interest. One is harmonizing policy formulation around the Caribbean. We coordinate regional ICT projects most recent, well, um, Roxanne here is the CASIP coordinator for St. Vincent, but there is a CASIP coordinator in Grenada and um, St. Lucia as well. And the overall CASIP program is coordinated at, out of the CTU office in, in Port of Spain. We also do um, coordinate other regional projects. We've just finished one on spectrum management in which um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines also participated. We do capacity development, that's the third area. We represent the, the, the region at international ICT fora, whether it be ITU, whether it be ICANN, um, LACNIC, ARIN, and, and these other um, organizations that we'll be hearing about and talking about today. And we also perform an industry watch function. So that involves some research and um, not really development, but more research and reporting to our members, in particular the governments and, and the ministers, in terms of what are the trends that are taking place, what are the things we need to be aware of uh, in making our laws and our, our policies at a, at a local level. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I'm Sharish John. This is where we end this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. On behalf of the production teams at the API, we invite you to join us again for another program. I am Nelly Skipper. Good night.